Hello everyone, it is December 5th, 2023. It's Tuesday. It's ARP Tuesday! Welcome to this week's episode. Today I'm going to be talking about pedal charts. What are they and what do we use them for? So this is of course particularly useful if you're new to the pedal harp, but even if you've been playing pedal harp for a while, hopefully there'll be something useful in here for you. So pedal charts are a visual depiction of the position of the seven pedals that we have on the harp at a particular point in time. So of course we have these seven pedals, A through G, the notes of the scale, and each pedal can be at a high setting, a middle setting, or a low setting. High is flat, middle is natural, lowest is sharp. And a pedal chart shows that position. So what we do is we draw a, a vertical line, a horizontal line, a horizontal line, and that's sort of the midpoint of the pedals. We draw a vertical line through the center, and that's kind of the center of the harp, the, the, this delineation between the left foot pedals and the right pedals. And then we draw smaller lines to show the position of the pedals. So in this case, if they're all natural, if we're in the key of C and they're all in the middle setting, we would draw, roop, roop, roop. there's the, you know, the, the D, C, B, E, F, G, A, all natural. Let's suppose we are in the key of D with two sharps. So we would have this, this would be natural, middle, lowest, middle, middle, low, middle, middle, etc. What if there's a flat? Let's suppose we're in the key of E flat, very common on lever harp. So that means all the uh, levers are, are down generally. So we'd have natural, natural, flat, the pedal is all the way up, up, flat, natural, natural, flat. And looking at that, right, it's such an easy way to see, oh, these are how my pedals are set. So that, in a nutshell, is what pedal charts are. This very easy to read visual representation of pedals and what they are set at at that one particular point in time. Why do we use these pedal charts? Well, because as I say, they're the easiest way to convey that information. When do we use them? Well, we certainly will use them at any point that we might start in a piece and where the pedal settings are not obvious. So if we're in the key of C with all the pedals in the middle and the piece is written in the key of C and throughout the piece we never have any key changes or accidentals, we would never need to use a, a, a pedal chart in that piece. It's, just, it's, it's very clear and obvious and there's no need for a pedal chart. But if we start a piece, for example, and the pedals are not in the setting that they would be for that key but something different, a pedal chart can be useful. Let's take some examples. So let's look at Rue. I just did a Harp Tuesday episode on this. And at the beginning of the piece, you can see I've, I've written in a pedal chart here. So at the beginning of the piece, Hasselman says set the G sharp, the sol sharp. And that's because the very first time that we play a G is right here and it's sharp. So we can go ahead and set that ahead of time. Great. And actually the first time we play a D, it's sharp. So we can certainly set that as well. And so you can see here this pedal chart then, we have the D sharp, natural, 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 sharp, natural. Well, it's a little bit messy there, but hopefully clear. And that's just a really easy way to see what's happening at the beginning of the piece. We set the pedals there. Could we do it a different way? Well, in a sense, he kind of has because he's written set G sharp. So we could say at the beginning of the piece, uh, if my pen will cooperate, we could say set D and G sharp, for example. It, it's implied that everything else is natural because we're in the key of C, everything's natural. We could do that, that could work. Uh, I, I, to me, it requires a little bit more brain power to process that than to just look at this pedal chart. Perhaps because I'm so familiar with pedal charts, but. I think it's just, it's the pedal chart is such a nice way to convey that information. Let's look at another similar example, the beginning of Renier's piece symphonique. So we could, she's actually given us the, the starting pedals that are different than the key. So the key would be the key of G flat with six flats. And we're gonna start with an A natural and a D sharp. So we could do that, or here's the pedal chart with a D sharp, with an A natural, Flat, 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 natural, flat, natural. 
Okay, so again, both of those are potential ways we could convey that information. But again, the pedal chart is, I think, the most efficient. Here's one more example, the beginning of uh, Jardin Moyer, where, okay, we have a natural, natural, flat, natural, flat, flat, flat. So again, we're in the key of G flat. If we wanted to think about how it would be in relationship to that, we would have to say, okay, we're going to set D, C, and E natural, and an F flat. Because normally we would be like this, and instead we have to be like this, right? There's four pedals that are different than they would be for the key. Also, just in terms of remembering it, how could we think of it? We could think of it's the key of F with one flat plus these three flats, or it's it's just not, it doesn't fall into any particularly great category that I, I can see. But this pedal chart, it's so easy to just kind of, okay, okay, like maybe we're here, we go natural, natural, flat, natural, flat, 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 flat. We're good to go. So again, such an efficient and useful way. So. Certainly at the beginning of any piece that has pedals set that are different than the key, we would stick a pedal chart in there. But it's not just at the beginning of the piece where you want to put pedal charts. Again, any time there's a spot where you might start, you want to put a pedal chart. Of course, if you go from the beginning of the piece and you play through the entire piece, if you play it accurately and follow the pedal markings, you will have the correct pedals at every point. But when you're learning a piece, you want to be able to start practicing, say, maybe halfway through this page or at the top of this page or the bottom of this page. And it's not always clear, perhaps, what the pedals are at that point. So any point where you decide, oh, I want to try practicing this section, you might want to put a pedal chart there if it's not clear. I put a pedal chart here halfway through because the pedals have changed quite a bit, right? So we started out with this. And then by the time we get here, oh, it's this, right? A lot of changes. And so if I want to start on that gliss, then I need a pedal chart there as well. Also, it's a way to aid memorization. So maybe I'm not actually ever starting right on that gliss, but I want to know when I get there, what are my pedals, right? It's a bunch of pedals. So for memorizing, uh, I want to know what are my pedal settings there and having a visual representation is one more thing we can, you know, if you've got a good photographic memory, you can start to, oh, I can picture the pedal settings there, the pedal chart. And again, the pedal chart is just a representation of the physical pedals. So again, we can, we can kind of tie that all in there together. So I think in a piece that's got a lot of modulation, putting in a bunch of pedal charts is great. It allows you to start at any point in the piece and it helps with memorization. There are some pieces uh, some contemporary pieces where uh, I'll put a pedal chart every bar, or maybe in some bars, uh, several, uh, two pedal charts, you know, up halfway through the bar or whatever, because there's so many pedals being changed. It also can be a way to catch yourself, give yourself a bit of a safety net. Let's say you're playing a piece and you're using the music, you're performing it, in a piece with a lot of pedal changes, if you have a bunch of pedal charts, then if something goes a little bit wrong, you know where you are for this next upcoming spot, rather than being uh, trying to scramble around and look back, oh, I should have changed this pedal here, that pedal there. You can look ahead and say, oh, here's what the pedals should be like at this point. Ah, at least I can be back in the right pedal setting going forward. If you're playing in an orchestra, it's really good to put a bunch of pedal charts in if, if there are is a lot of modulation, because you never know in a rehearsal when the conductor might say, oh, we want to start in bar 57 or rehearsal letter H or whatever. And you want to be able to have the pedal chart for that point in time. And if also, if you are arranging a piece or transcribing a piece, it can be useful to throw in a bunch of pedal charts as you're doing that to remind yourself of where the pedals are and what notes you have available. So next, I just wanted to show you two examples of alternatives to pedal charts and how much more difficult they are to my mind to read. So here's the end of Salcedo's Song of the Night, and he gives us this scale for this gliss. He shows us all seven notes in our, in our scale, right? And so we can use that to check what our pedals should be at this point. So C sharp, D natural, because we're in the key of C, everything's natural by default here. E flat, F sharp, G flat, A natural, B flat. 
but I can't do that much faster than I just did it for you. I have to go through one by one, and it's it's quite a quite a taxing challenge. Whereas if I look at the pedal chart that I wrote in about that, I can quite quickly get to that point. And it's so much easier and so much more intuitive. Now, maybe it's because of lots of practice, but I don't know. I think you might agree that the pedal chart is just, is just easier. And I would say an even harder way that sometimes people will write things out is to write the notes. So there, Salzedo wrote the notes on the staff. Here, and this is the heart part to Ripsky korsakovs uh, Capriccio Espanol, and here the notes for these glisses have been written out. Uh, so first of all, they're written in German, so that relies on you knowing the German, which of course is less common than, than uh, French uh, notation. Um, and unlike the notes in the staff, the Salzedo, where it doesn't matter what language you speak, you, you know what the, all those are, here you have to know that, for example, this is C flat, D natural, E sharp, F, G sharp, A flat, and H is B, is B natural. So we arrive there, but because I'm, I'm not uh, super fluent in, in German, but even if this was English or French, it would take me a lot longer than, again, to just kind of look at this pedal chart and say, oh, flat, and we got a sharp and a sharp and a flat. There we are. So just so much more efficient. And yeah, so pedal charts are great. Definitely sprinkle them in liberally throughout pieces if there's a bunch of modulation, a bunch of pedal changes, and it's not always clear what the pedal should be. Pop a pedal chart in. But if it's a piece that has no modulation at all, no um, pedal changes, you won't need a pedal chart at all throughout that piece. So hope that's been useful, and I will see you next week for another episode of Harp Tuesday. <laughs> Cheers. So if you're new to the pedal harp, maybe you've just got a new pedal harp, it can take some time to get used to the order of the pedals, which pedal corresponds with which note in the scale, A through G. And I'll often get asked, well, why don't the pedals just go, for example, A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Why don't they go in alphabetical order? Why this kind of weird order? And to remind you, the order is D, C, B, E, F, G, A. And, and you can think, well, well, that's kind of random. Now, you can always, if you're ever unsure, you can always just check. Move a pedal and check the discs. Which discs is it, is it moving? Oh, this must be the C pedal. How about this pedal over here? Oh, it's the A pedal. Right? It, 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 easy enough to figure out what it is. But in terms of the order, there is, I think, a certain logic to it, and it has to do with pairs of notes that are often becoming flat or sharp at the same time. So if you think about key signatures, the first flat that we get is a B, and the second flat that we get is an E. So if they're both being operated by the same foot, it would be awkward because you might often, as you're modulating, end up having one of these get changed, or maybe both of them, and better to have them split between the feet rather than on the same foot. Because there's a huge difference between something like this, right, where you can change them both at the same time if you wish, and trying to say change the, the C and the B at the same time, or the C and the D, where it's, yeah, you're much harder. So you get these pairs of flats. If you think again about key signatures, the first sharp that we get is an F sharp, the second is a D sharp. The uh, second is a C sharp, sorry. I moved the right pedal, but I said the wrong word. Then a G sharp, then a D sharp. So you kind of see this, this certain amount of logic. Now we get B flat, E flat, and then an A flat. So the E and the A are on the same side. But in general, I think it's this, this pairing of, of the standard sort of harmonic modulation we might be doing that is the reason this feet are split up as they are, so that more often than not, when we get pedal changes, we when we have to do two pedals at the same time, oftentimes they are on opposite sides with the two feet, rather than trying to do you know to to uh, do it once with the same foot. So that's the theory. It doesn't necessarily help in terms of memorizing the order but at least it maybe feels that it's less just some sort of random hodgepodge 
and that there is at least some logic behind that. So I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Cheers.